Okay, so uh, this is going to be an interactive through uh, MCQs. We are going to go through acute coin syndrome, chronic coin syndrome, and heart failure. Uh, some details about all of the three. Now, the first question is this. Which of the following is the main cause of acute coronary syndrome? Easy. Atherometer's plaque rupture, in situ thrombosis, spontaneous coronary dissection, embolization from aortic valve or root calcification, all of the above. Huh? Anybody? So which one do you think is the right answer here? I think all of the above. Good, okay, all of the above. Okay. Because ATS it include non STEMI and uh, STEMI and unstable angina. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Embolization from aortic valve or a stuck uh, prostatic valve can cause uh, acute coronary syndrome. Also, uh, uh, aceromatous plaque rupture inside thrombosis. And. Emma? Okay, I think so. Okay, so uh, I think um, you are right, Zainab, that all of these factors or pathological factor or pathological mechanism for acute coronary syndrome. But the question is about the main cause. Well, the, the main cause main. is the aceromatous plaque rupture. Exactly. Thank you so much. By far and away, aceromatous plaque rupture is the most common cause of acute coronary syndrome. Having said that, we know that. We can have inside thrombosis, aortic dissection, embolization from aortic ball, and all of that, okay? Always careful about the wording of the question, about the main cause, not causes of the question. Now, which of the following represents irreversible cardiomyopathy? Irreversible cardiomyopathy. Ischemic cardiomyopathy. I'm going to mute you. Okay. Again, uh, huh? which of the following represent or represents irreversible cardiomyopathy? Ischemic cardiomyopathy with thinning out an aneurysmal apex, tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy, COVID related cardiomyopathy, stress induced cardiomyopathy, chemotherapy induced cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. Which one? Ischemic A. Exactly. Yes. Yes. If if I if if the question is about ischemic cardiomyopathy, without further labeling, it is reversible. Ischemic cardiomyopathy is potentially reversible cardiomyopathy with revascularization. But if there is already established thinning out and aneurysmal apex means scar tissue it becomes irreversible. Tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy is potentially reversible cardiomyopathy. COVID-related cardiomyopathy is potentially reversible. Stress-induced and chemo-induced cardiomyopathy are potentially reversible cardiomyopathies. Okay? Good. Now, which of the following 
are the current repertoire of non-invasive testing for ischemia. Exercise ECG halter stress echo PET and cardiac CT. CMR halter cardiac markers expect. PET expect CCT, exercise ECG and stress echo. CMR CCT expect and stress echo. Hmm? I think up front you are going to exclude A and B because halter is not an uninvasive testing for ischemia. So A, B are out. So is it C or is it D? C. D. Uh-huh. Anybody else? Any? Sorry, which one? C or D? D, manual exercise ECG. Mostly like prognosis. Yeah. So it is C, right? Yes. Okay. So if I take this one here, stress echo is one. Expect, expect, CCT, CCT. Now, PET and exercise ECG and CMR. Which one you are going to choose, C or D? You said C, right? Why not D? CMR isn't used for uh ischemia testing no no categorically no no is big deal i think cmr is also used for ischemia testing i understand the logistics are difficult to exercise the patient and the cmr scanner but they are giving vasodilator challenge like adenosine or Rigadinison, and they check ischemia before and after. So CMR is established method of non-invasive testing for ischemia. But D is not the right answer. It is C. But you have to remember that CMR can be used for ischemia testing. But it's not the current repertoire Currently, currently, in cardiac centers, they are using PET, ISPEC, cardiac CT, exercise CC, and stress echo. In the future, CMR might take over. We might have a bigger space than now for ischemia testing. But theoretically and practically, CMR can be used for ischemia testing but not in the current repertoire, okay? So now what we have is PET and SPEC, nuclear cardiology, CCT, exercise, ECG, and stress, echo. So we have one, two, three, four, five non-invasive testing for ischemia. And CMR might soon be the sixth one, okay? Good. Now, 70-year-old patient is admitted to intensive care with pneumonia, which necessitated intubation. He also went hypotensive. He started on inotropic support. During the course of hospitalization, he developed acute renal injury and hooked on continuous renal replacement therapy, CRRT. His chest X-ray as shown below. You see, 
is chest pain, whiting out, consolidation, congestion, all of that. Okay, now troponin is 0.56, then 0.94, then 1.2 over a course of a day and a half. His pro PNP is 3,500. Which of the following statements are true? So this is a patient who is intubated with pneumonia. It's just x-ray as we have seen. His troponin is increasing. Pro PNP is high at 3,500. So the rising troponin level is consistent with acute coronary syndrome. Elevated pro PMP is due to ischemic cardiomyopathy. The cardiomegaly in the chest X-ray and the elevated pro PMP indicate severe LV systolic dysfunction. The rising troponin and pro PMP may be due to sepsis and metabolic derangement. So, uh huh. So which one? Any guess? C. C. B. Uh, C. C. Okay, so we have C. Any other opinion? D. Uh, D. 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 Yes. Okay. Okay, so nobody is taking A, nobody is taking B, which is good. The rising troponin level is consistent with the Kirchhoff syndrome, not necessarily. Although it's very tempting to assume that this patient is having a Kirchhoff syndrome, non STEMI or STEMI based on ECG, but uh, it's not necessarily because you could still have a similar rising trend with this dynamic clinical scenario of a patient who is admitted with severe pneumonia, intubated, acute renal injury. Acute renal injury can lead to that kind of, although chronic kidney failure leads usually to elevated troponin, but of flat trend, Acute renal injury might change the picture and during the course of the acute injury in which the renal function is deteriorating day in and day out, the troponin might also be increasing. But if you have a stable chronic kidney disease, you assume that the troponin should be or most likely will be of flat trend. So, Rising troponin in this case is not necessarily a Kirchhoff syndrome. Now, pro PMP is due to ischemic cardiomyopathy. Of course, you have all ruled this one out, and that's true because any kind of cardiomyopathy can lead to pro PMP. Valve disease can lead to high pro PMP, including sepsis and metabolic derangement through imposition of cardiomyopathy. Now, cardiomegaly in chest X-ray and elevated pro PMP indicates severe LV systolic dysfunction, and this is again not necessarily. First of all, the cardiomegaly in the chest X-ray, as we all know that in the portable chest X-ray in ICU setting, you are unlikely to magnify and overestimate the cardiac um, uh, size. Okay, elevated pro PMB is not necessarily severe LV systolic dysfunction. Yeah, you can have elevated pro PMB with valve disease, right? You can have high pro PMB with mild, mild re reduced ejection fraction heart failure. You can also have elevated pro PMB with preserved heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So it's not necessarily heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The rising troponin and pro PMP may be due to sepsis and metabolic derangement. Yes, sepsis and metabolic derangement can impose severe kind of cardiomyopathies, sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy, 
metabolic induced cardiomyopathy in which you have a rising toponin and propiate B. Okay, and that might be uh, the scenario in this patient. Good. Now the ECG is of a patient who presented with compressive chest pain. Which of the following is true? The degree of ST elevation is not prognostic. Coronary angiogram will most likely reveal occluded RCA. Echo will most likely be normal. Nomotroponin will rule out acute myocardial infarction. Thrombotic occlusion of the proximal LAD is revealed in coronary angiogram. Easy. Easy one. Uh -huh. e. E. Good. Anybody else? Any other opinion? E. E. Good. E or A? You say E? E. 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 Okay. E. So nobody is taking A. Coronary angiogram will show occluded RCA. Not right. Echo will most likely be normal. It's not right. No mm -hmm. metroponin will rule out acute myocardial infarction. Not necessarily. So you have chosen the right answer, which is thrombotic occlusion of proximal LAD. Yeah. So that means what? The degree of ST elevation is prognostic. It is prognostic. ST elevation indicates transmural injury. Okay. ST segment depression may indicate subendocardial injury, but ST segment elevation is transmural injury. Now, the transmural injury is more severe and more transmural, meaning including all the wall. The more you have of ST segment elevation. So if you have it like two millimeter, five millimeter, 10 millimeter, the higher the height of the ST segment elevation, the more injury is there, okay? So this is important concept because we initially thought that it's all about the extent of ST segment elevation. I mean, the number of leads involved. If there are two leads or three leads, or four leads of the anterior leads and stuff like that. So how diffuse or how uh, extensive the leads are involved is definitely prognostic. And we thought that the only prognostic marker of the ST segment elevation, but not only that, even the extent of ST segment elevation is prognostic. And how high the ST segment elevation gets up is important prognostically. Okay. Now, echo most likely in this patient is going to show regional wall motion abnormalities, hypokinesis, and or akinesis in the LAD area. Because that is transmural injury, and transmural injury is unlikely to be missed by echo. Compare that with subendocardial injury in non STEMI in which you can have normal echo, perfectly normal echo. In non STEMI echo is not going to rule out non STEMI but echo is probably going to rule out STEMI if it's normal, okay? So it is thrombotic occlusion. Now, do you have any name for this degree of ST segment elevation? Tombstone. Uh, sorry? Tombstone. Tombstone. So this is tombstoning of the ST segment elevation. So it looks like the tombstone اللي هو الحجر بتاع المقبرة اللي بيكون شكله كده. They call it like that, tombstoning. Okay. Because what is happening here, we don't actually have ST. We have the QRS complex. The R is taken and engulfed with the ST segment elevation. That's why it looks this way. Supposed to be the R is independent and we have ST segment elevation like that.
But now both are, because this one is high enough, it engulfs the R. So you see it like sinusoidal wave like that, okay? So this is tomb stony of the ST elevation. Now, this patient has history of multiple PCI, readmitted with decompensated heart failure. Which of the following drug regimen should he be discharged on? Impagliflozin, valsartan sacubitril, fisoprolol and furosemide. In April, fisoprolol, digoxin and furosemide. Valsartan, impagliflozin, furosemide, spironolactone. Impagliflozin, valsartan sacubitril, which is interest to bisoprolol, furosemide, spironolactone. Evabridine, verisiquat, digoxin, bisoprolol and frosamide. So which one? C. D. 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 Okay. Right. Well done. So it's D. Now, E includes evabridine and verisiquat, both of which are used or can be used in the treatment of such kind of heart failure, but they are a third or fourth line of therapy in case of failure of the first line therapy, which is SGLT2 inhibitor, ARNI, beta blocker, MRA, and diuretics. So we have five important first line medications. Impagliflozin, valsartan sacupitril, pisoprolol as beta blocker, a spironolactone as MRA, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. So this is the right choice. Okay? Good. And as you see here, what type of ischemic cardiomyopathy here? As the echo shows. What kind of cardiomyopathy? Dilated. Sorry? Dilated cardiomyopathy. Dilated cardiomyopathy. Is it ischemic or non ischemic? Multiple PCI indicates that of ischemic. Okay. Multiple PCIs, but also from the picture on the left, you could tell me that, that is ischemic cardiomyopathy. Why? Exactly, exactly. Yes. So you see here, this posterior wall is echinetic, it is thinned out, and it is echo dense, indicating scarring. Okay, so you see here, compare it to the anterior septum, you see here it's echinetic, thinner, and echo dense. And also, the, there is a problem with the mitral valve here, and there is severe mitral regurgitation. But morphologically, what you can, how can you describe this mitral valve? There is what? Sorry? Sorry? Again? Overshooting. Uh huh. The posterior, uh, the posterior leaflet. Exactly, huh? Yes, yes. Exactly. Very good. So we have a fixed tether posterior leaflet. Anterior leaflet is pliable, but the posterior leaflet is fixed because it's anchored on the papillary muscle of which is anchored on the posterior wall, which is thinned out echinetic. That's why it's stretched out. So we have this one, which is epically tethered because of this. And that's why if I have MR, I'm expecting the MR to go in this direction, to be posteriorly directed this way. And that was the case in this patient. He has severe posteriorly directed MR, ischemic mitral regurgitation, ischemic, ischemic MR, because of the tethering of the posterior leaflet due to posterior wall ischemia. 
Okay, good. Now we have this patient, and probably I have shown you this case before. It is a 45 year old um, male, female, I really don't remember. And the stage renal disease on hemodialysis for two months. Echo is requested as part of renal transplant workup. What is the next course of action? You see the LV is dilated and significantly impaired. The ejection fraction was calculated as 85%. And you have significant mitral regurgitation. Now, surgery for MR, list for heart transplant, coronary angiogram, medical therapy and follow-up, rule out ischemic heart disease, medical therapy, escalation of dialysis and follow-up. Mm -hmm. e. E. B. B. List for e. E. Ah, e. E. Okay. Okay, great, great. So um, nobody is going for surgery for Emma. They have severe MR. We have severe LV dysfunction. We know that severe MR with symptoms and or LV dysfunction, EF less than 60 is plus one indication for surgery. So why now you are not choosing surgery for MR? We should discuss because this patient, please. Most likely secondary MR. Most likely secondary MR, yes. Right? Most likely secondary MR. Good. And most likely. Most likely. Uh -huh. after. Uh, again. The MR and the L. Most likely. Okay. Good. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the cases you really have to slow down before you jump on drastic measures like surgery. Because um, there is a possibility of uh, that this cardiomyopathy is renal failure related and you could escalate the dialysis in a short time of three months or so and you could review the, uh, the progress, okay? And, and that's what we have done in this patient actually. We have ruled out ischemic heart disease. We put the patient on medical therapy for heart failure as his renal failure will allow us. And we did escalation of dialysis and we followed up this patient, okay? And actually after um, two or three months, I'm not really so sure precise about the time, the LV function has recovered. And here is the MR, which is just a small jet of MR as comparison to this big MR. You see the MR here before and the MR after within two to three months. Okay, so this is kind of reversible cardiomyopathy. So in reversible cardiomyopathy, you have to treat the radical cause, okay? You have to be radical here, okay? okay. So if you go deeper to these uh, reversible causes and you deal with them, you could follow the LV function because potentially it might improve. And with the improvement in LV function, you expect improvement in MR, and that's what the case in this patient, okay? Now, uh, uh, sorry, uh, was, I have a question. Sure. Uh, in this case, what is the, the best uh, investigation to rule out ischemia? Uh, is uh, it coronary angiography? No, no. Uh, again, the same thing. Usually, if the, in this patient, he was asymptomatic. He, he was having no chest pain. Okay. If the patient right. is having chest pain, like angina, okay, I, I think the best way to go is coronary angiogram. Or if the, if the echo was showing regional wall motion of normality, meaning ischemic cardiomyopathy, coronary angio is the way to go. But if the patient is asymptomatic and the echo is showing global hypokinesis, not regional wall motion of normalities, you go for non-invasive testing, okay? And that's what we have selected for this patient. We did nuclear inspect 
and we ruled out ischemic heart disease. But if he is symptomatic and or regional wall motion abnormality are showing an echo, it's better to go right away for coronary angiogram. Okay, okay, thank you. Now we have 65 year old male admitted with decompensated heart failure. His ECG showed AF of 95 beat per minute rate. His echo showed ejection fraction of 25% with no interval changes from the last echo six months ago. This time, however, his echo showed higher LV EDP and moderately severe MR. The latter, which is the severe MR, moderately severe MR, has progressed from only mild mitral regurgitation. Which of the following is true? So a patient known to have heart failure presented this occasion with decompensated heart failure. We found that he has high fa fast AF, ejection fraction was 50% and he still is 50%. Uh, his LV, uh, uh, diastolic dysfunction is now of higher grade and MR was mild, now moderately severe. So the absence of interval changes in ejection fraction indicates that the decompensation is due to non-cardiac causes. The progression in mitral regurgitation from mild to moderately severe is due to cordial rupture due to the stretch of the dilated LP. The non-adherence to medication is a rare cause of decompensation. The treated decompensation does not increase mortality. The uncontrolled arrhythmia is a cause of decompensation. So, what do you think is right here? Also E. E. Yes, E. Anybody else? Okay, E. So now the absence of interval change in ejection fraction indicates that the decompensation is due to non cardiac cause. That is definitely untrue because patient, you don't expect that patient of HFREF, when they come with decompensation, their ejection fraction is going to shift from a higher to a lower grade. No, probably their ejection fraction remains the same. Yes, there are some times when you have an ejection fraction of 40 or 35 that goes to lower than that. But in most, uh, in, in the highest number of patients, what you get is the same ejection fraction, but different loading condition, different LV EDP, okay? Like in this case. The progression in mitral regain is due to caudal rupture, due to the stretch of dilated LV. Usually the progress is because of increased dilatation and annular stretch leading to coaptation gap in the mitral valve. So the coaptation gap and the effacement of the leaflet has increased due to the dilatation of the end range. Usually it's not due to caudal rupture, it's due to the dilatation of the annulus, due to the dilatation of the LV. Non-adherence to the medication is a rare cause of decompensation. Of course, it is a common cause of decompensation. That's why with any decompensation, you have to inquire about adherence to medication. Is the patient taking his medication appropriately and in appropriate time? So the appropriate amount of medication in the appropriate time, you have to inquire and ask about that. You also have to ask if the patient is having medication, over-the-counter medication, or otherwise, that might decompensate him or her, like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and stuff like that. You also have to consider that infection is a common cause of decompensation, arrhythmia, ischemia, all of that. So you have to put in consideration the causes of decompensation. Okay, so in decompensation, don't direct your resources only to treat the decompensation. You have to see why this patient 
decompensated in the first place. And adherence or lack of adherence is a common cause of decompensation. So adherence and compliance, compliance and adherence. Which one you think is right word? Compliance or adherence? You say that the patient is compliant to medication. The patient is adherent to medication. We used to say compliance and compliant, right? Right? But this word is dying away and is replaced by adherence and non-adherence, so lack of adherence. Why? لأنه compliance معناته إيش بالعربي؟ compliance معناته الإزعان adherence معناته الالتزام فكلمة الإزعان فيها دكتاتورية شوية لما تقول إنه لأنه المديكيشن دي is never about إزعان المريض it's about a dialogue you made with the patient okay an informed consent you make with the patient you have to inform him so well about all these medications how they do, what are the potential expected uh, outcome, and all of that, okay? So this kind of dialogue may make it adherence, iltizam. He will be committed according to the information you convey to him. It's not about guardianship or you are paternalistically imposing orders and instruction on the patient. That's why the word compliance, which means that is an, is out, and adherence is the right word for this description. The treated decompensation does not increase mortality. Unfortunately, any decompensation adds to the mortality, even if treated well and the patient is discharged from hospital. So the uncontrolled arrhythmia is the cause of decompensation in this patient. That might be the right answer, which is the right answer here. AF, fast AF is a reason or a cause of decompensation in this patient. Now, again, we have seen this slide over and over that we have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, with mildly reduced ejection fraction, with preserved ejection fraction. So if ejection fraction is lower than 40, that is half ref. If it's more than 50, that is half pef, and in between is mildly reduced. But I told you before that we also, um, they might go, uh, they might add, heart failure with super or supranormal ejection fraction. Supranormal ejection fraction, which is defined as ejection fraction more than 65. So a fourth column might come here, the fourth column, and it is called heart failure with supranormal ejection fraction, in which the ejection fraction is more than 65. Why this distinction? Why this distinction? Why? Yani HFPF is from anything above 550, including 60, 65 and above. Why they made this distinction, we will see uh, in a bit. Now, in, in terms of mortality, HFPF is as fatal as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So in terms of all-cause mortality, you see all-cause mortality here, HFPF and HFREF are equally fatal. But in terms of cardiovascular mortality, cardiovascular mortality, HFREF is more, more than heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. What does that mean? This is an important thing you should know. Okay? You might be asked about this. So in terms of overall, all-cause mortality, all-cause death, HFREF and HFPEF are equal. But cardiovascular death is more in REF than in PEF, and non-cardiovascular death is more in PEF than REF, but the overall mortality is equal. Okay? Yes. Good. And this is, you see here, this is the cardiac mortality in pink, which is 65% in ref, 46% in mild range in, uh, or in, in mild reduced, and 38% in heart failure is preserved ejection fraction. But other causes 
like respiratory cancer, sepsis, renal failure, stuff like that, are more in PEF than REF. And this balances the mortality. So the overall mortality is equal in both conditions. Now, all causary admission are similar again. So if again here, all causary admission of PEF and REF are equal. But cardiovascular readmission is more in is more in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And non-cardiovascular readmission is more in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So this is important. So now all cause mortality is equal between ref and PEF. All cause readmission is equal between HEF and PEF. But the mortality, our readmission, cardiovascular mortality, our readmission is more common in REF than in PEF. A non-cardiovascular mortality and readmission is more common in PEF than REF. Okay? Good? You get this one, right? Yeah. Now, good. No medicine has proven to be of mortality benefit in all groups of HEF PEF. The efforts are now directed at dividing heart failure with preserved ejection fraction into different phenotypes. Which of the following is true? Landmark trials of FPEF have shown a special group mortality benefit. The low range of ejection fraction in FPEF was more likely to get mortality benefit than high range ejection fraction HEFPEF in clinical trials. HEFPEF arises from different causes, but present with the same clinical features. Patient of HEFPEF on the lower range of HEFPEF have more mortality. What's the meaning of this? Patient of HEFPEF on the lower range of, I didn't understand this one here, and that's why I'm going to take this one out. Please disregard this. Okay, so A, B, and C, which one you think is right? Landmark trials has have shown a special group mortality benefit. The low range was more likely to get mortality benefit than the high range. Uh -huh. Here, there is no only one answer, by the way. There are two right answers and one is wrong. So which one? B and C. B and C. B and C are right? Okay. Because no mortality benefit. No is, mortality benefit. But uh, there is benefit in, the, in hospitalization. Okay. Good. Thank you. I'm going to show you some quick evidence that in the landmark trials, special group mortality benefit was seen clearly. Some special group of HEFPEF gets mortality benefit, others don't. Because HEFPEF is very heterogeneous, okay? There are so many phenotypes of HEFPEF. So the clinical trial gets lost because HEFPEF is not a uniform homogeneous disease. We are packing the clinical trial with so many heterogeneous patients. So when they do subgroup analysis, they find some groups get mortality benefit, others don't. The overall is no mortality benefit, the overall. But if they focus on a special group, there is mortality benefit. And they also have found that the lower range of ejection fraction fares better in term of mortality. Yani, if the ejection fraction is 50, 
to 57, they have spotted out this range. Or above 57. Above 57. If the patient or patients have ejection fraction in this range, they are likely to get mortality benefit. Above 57, they don't. So they call it when the ejection fraction goes north. As the ejection fraction goes north, north means 57 and above. If it goes south, 57 and below, mortality benefit is detected. Above is not detected, okay? So this is important. Now, HFPF arises from different causes and present clinically different as well. Even the clinical presentation of HFPF is different. So HFPF is different in the etiology and presentation. Now, I have shown you that this one here, they are probably gonna add HFPF with supernormal. Why is that? Because if the ejection fraction is here, 60%. Let's say that here is 60%. As the ejection fraction goes up, goes north, huh? mortality increases. As it goes south, the mortality increases. But it increases here if it reduces, becomes severe LV dysfunction. Okay, that means what? Ejection fraction that is too high or too low, both are bad. That's why patients of an ejection fraction above 65, they have higher mortality than patients lesser than 65, but more than 50. If you start to get the uh, ejection fraction lower than 50 and down more, the mortality increases. So it is between 50 and 57, which is the good ejection fraction in HFPF. Above that, that increases the mortality, okay? So high ejection fraction isn't good at all. Now, if you see here, there are so many studies, you have probably known some of them, the primary endpoint in HFPF, which was mortality, were all neutral. Uh, you can see here, for example, this is um, angiotensin neprilysin inhibitor in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. That was Paragon. You see here, death, death between valsartan and sacupitril valsartan is the same. But hospitalization and death both together is better in interest to. Hospitalization is better in interest to than valsartan. So in terms of hospitalization for heart failure, valsartan, sacupitril is better than valsartan. In terms of hospitalization and heart failure, okay, uh, sorry, in, in terms of hospitalization and death together as a composite endpoint, sacubetary and valsartan is still better than valsartan. But if we take death alone, mortality alone, no difference. So you could consider that Paragon was negative trial as to mortality in all groups. Again, emperor preserved which is empagliflozin in heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. Look here at the cumulative incidence, which include hospitalization and death. There is a difference between the two, but cardiovascular death alone is no difference between empagliflozin and placebo. So mortality alone, no difference, but mortality hospitalization as composite endpoint it's better in empagliflozin. So far, so disappointing. But signal in trend of a special 
beneficiaries. Look here. In this uh, emperor preserved, look at the ejection fraction from 50 to 65 and from 45 to 65, this ejection fraction. Okay, you see the benefit is better in this ejection fraction from 45 to 64 compared to ejection fraction above 65. So again, here you can also see that ejection fraction in this range has shown a better outcome with empagli flows in than placebo. This is in terms of mortality. And this is hospitalization. Now, see here, female gets better, uh, female here gets better mortality benefit with ARNI than males. See where the male are and where the female are. Okay. The other thing here, female are here, male are damned to be not beneficiary of army. Look at the ejection fraction below 57 mortality benefit compared to above 57 no mortality benefit. يعني أنا يا أخوانا في نهاية الأمر عايزكم تعرفوا معلومة إنه ال clinical trials كلها has failed to indicate mortality benefit in all groups مع بعض when they are brought all packed up together but when they are separated into subgroup في subgroup find إنها عندها robust mortality benefit اللي هم الفيميل جروب مثلا when patient of ejection fraction lower than 57. Okay, that's why now people think that FPF should be unpacked into different phenotypes. It is not right to pack FPF all in one big cargo because in this case, we are gonna miss the treatment and all clinical trials are gonna be failure. Okay, so remember there were signal in the clinical trial that have shown mortality benefit in special groups, but not in all groups, okay? That's why people now think of phenotyping of HEF-PEF, phenotyping, okay? Like this one here, this is a proposition of phenotyping into garden variety HEF-PEF. Garden variety HEF-PEF means you have at least three uh, risk factor like hypertension, diabetes, renal failure, atrial uh, stuff like that. Okay. Cro ischemia or artery disease, HFPF is a special category. Right heart failure, HFPF, HFPF that present basically with right heart, uh, right sided heart failure. Atrial fibrillation, predominant HFPF. Who come like HFPF in which you do echo and you? Fine, big junk of muscle, severe or moderate LVH. High output FPF, valvular FPF. You remember now if I have severe AR, severe MR, severe, this is severe diseases leading to um, heart failure. But what if I have moderate MR, moderate AR, and heart failure? This is valvular heart failure with preserved ejection fraction because moderate valve here and moderate valve there together they can sum up to having severe kind of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction the message is don't bother yourself with this listing but the most important message here i would like to convey is that fpf is now undergoing a process of phenotyping phenotype okay 
and there is exercise induced HFPF volume overloaded HFPF pulmonary hypertension on right sided HFPF. These are three important phenotypes with different etiologies and different presentations. يبقى أنا ما عايز أغلبكم كثير في الهيف بيف ده ولكن المسج الأساسية اللي عايزكم تصلوا لها إنه الهيف بيف دي الآن في مجهود كبير جدا قايم في اتجاه no longer to consider الهيف بيف إنه a single disease entity ولكنه heterogeneous and therefore we have to phenotype it إنه هف بف كده هف بف كده هف بف كده هف بف كده إلى الآن there is no fixed uniform agreed upon phenotyping of هف بف ولكن المجهود is going on to do that okay والكلام ده جميع من فين جميع من السيجنة اللي جات من ال clinical trials that has shown إنه some patient benefit others don't that means the هف بف is a big cargo We have to unload it. We have to divide it. عشان نعرف منو اللي بيستفيد منو اللي ما بيستفيد وهكذا. تمام. Now classification of heart failure according to symptoms. We have New York Heart Association class one. I remember one of the question in the oral exam for our fellows was about what is NYHA. Classification, and believe it or not, um, it was a fatal question asked by one of the difficult examiner. I, I wouldn't like somebody to be failed because doesn't know what NYHA stands for. But remember, the abbreviation we are using are important, so you have to know exactly. What you are alluding to when you use these abbreviations. So Niha, we say Niha class, NYHA class. So you have to know this is New York Heart Association classification. And this is we know Niha class one, two, three, and four. And we know what does each one mean. Now we have also staging A, B, C, and D. A means at risk. What's the meaning of at risk? The added patient has no symptoms of heart failure, has no structural heart disease, but is diabetic, hypertensive, has ischemic heart disease. This is called at risk of heart failure, and this is a stage A heart failure. Now, we stage B asymptomatic structural heart disease. Yani is a patient in the LVH, in the valve disease, or in the poor ejection fraction. But asymptomatic, this is class B. Class C. He has the same structural diseases, but with symptoms this time. Now, in this state, terminal refractory to standard therapy is class D. Okay, so this is important. We also have a classification of heart failure according to the level of congestion and perfusion. Into warm and dry, the best, cold and wet, the worst. And in between, we have warm and wet, cold and dry. Okay. So you have to test for the warmth and the circulation and the wet means the level of congestion. So cold and wet means the patient is hypoperfused and congested. Warm and dry means the patient is not hypoperfused and not congested. Okay. Now, what are the most common cause of cardiomyopathies? By far, it is ischemic heart disease, valve heart disease and idiopathic cardiomyopathies. But the list is long. We have myocarditis, peripartum cardiomyopathy, tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, stress-induced, genetic and mixed. We also have autoimmune connective tissue disease, endocrinopathies, infectious disease, infiltrative di diseases, nutritional deficiencies, neuromuscular storage diseases, Toxin-induced cardiomyopathy. So the cardiomyopathy can be caused by a host of factors. Okay, but the most important causes of cardiomyopathy we encounter in clinical practice basically relates to ischemic heart disease, valve and idiopathy. Okay. Now, tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. What do you know about this? 
tick tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy or tachycardiomyopathy. So what's the meaning of that? Any idea? Yeah. Hello, are you following me? Yes, it will help. Okay, so tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy is basically um, tachycardia that has led to cardiomyopathy. Uh, supraventricular tachycardia or ventricular tachycardia. The precise mechanism behind tachycardiomyopathy is not fully uh, understood but probably energy consumptions because of tachycardia and the impact of that and the ischemia and the fibrosis that uh, kicks in might be a cause. But we now know for, very well that if tachycardia is high enough and of a duration long enough, theoretically can lead to tachycardia mills. Okay, and you see this is a patient of PVCs in couplets, and you see that upon presentation, the LV was dilated two months after ablation of VTAX, it become better and much better one year post ablation. That was tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. The problem of tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy sometimes is hard to diagnose. Uh, prospectively, yeah, it's hard to go into the patient that into tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. Yeah, and a Jack patient with Vita, I mean, uh, PVCs, multiple PVCs, more than 20% in halter, couplets, or uh, and, and stuff like that. And he had ejection fraction, let's say, of 20, 30%. So, is it the heart failure leading to PVC or the PVC leading to heart failure? It's hard to know. It's hard. Okay. But that is the diagnosis retrospectively. You do ablation for arrhythmia and the heart recovers or you control the heart rate by medication and the heart recovers. So that is probably tachycardia induced. Okay. Now what is this? And I think I have shown you this patient before. What is this? Again. Uh -huh. Any idea? Uh, there is apical hypokinesia. Yes, great. Okay, what else? I'm so sorry, I don't know. I, I couldn't hold the picture. I don't know why. Okay, so what do you think now? First of all, this patient is having a metallic valve. You see this one here? That's a metallic valve. This one is a metallic valve. RV is okay here. And we have akinesis starting from the mid, all this. This is all hypokinetic or akinetic. So we have a multi-territorial hypokinesia. Beyond the one that can be explained with uh, acute coronary syndrome. This patient presented acutely with chest pain, shortness of breath, ECG changes in form of ST depression, and modest elevation in troponin of 0.1, 0.2. So this is a diagnosis of stress-induced cardiomyopathy, all right? Stress-induced cardiomyopathy, good? Okay, now, if you show me here, this one, did you see this kind of bubbles that comes here? Here, uh-huh. You see some bubbles? 
in the cavity. Yes, yes. What are yes. these? What are these? This relates to the metallic valve. All metallic valves will show this kind of bubbles in the chamber, okay? They sometimes call it vacuolation, stuff like that, but this is normal with metallic valve. Good. Now, look here, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. What's the treatment? Beta blocker, ARNI SGLT2. Class one indication, baseline therapy. You can add MRA. Now, the second line is to consider CRT, Evabridine, and Versiquat. Look where the dioxin is. Yani, subhanallah, 20, 30 years ago, the dioxin was number one. Now the dioxin is so downgraded, okay? Now, heart failure, with mildly reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. How many class one indication do we have? We have only one, use of diuretics to relieve congestion. All the rest are class 2A, 2B. SGLT2, ACE and ARNI, MRA and others. SGLT2, ARNI and MRA. Okay, now if I ask you, in which patient of HFPF do you expect ARNI and SGLT2 to be of more benefit? In which patient of HFPF you expect SGLT2 inhibitors and ARNI to be of better benefit? Uh-huh. Which one? The hypertensive patient and diabetic will get more benefit from uh, ARNI and SGLT. Uh-huh. And the other thing we talked in the studies was the signals to our subgroup benefit, which is female. Female and? Female and uh, ejection fraction 50 to 50. Exactly, exactly. So you have to remember this. If you are giving SGLT2 and ARNI, you expect that females will do better. If the ejection fraction is between 50 and 57, are going to do better. Okay, good. Remodeling, I'm gonna skip this one. Now, this is the decompensation. You see, with each decompensation, you go so down, but with the recovery and discharge from hospital, you are never back to the baseline. You lost the baseline once and for all, and you set a new lower baseline. Now, a second decompensation comes. Your new baseline is here. A third one, your new is here. So decompensation, each decompensation, even if treated fully and patient recovers and goes out of hospital, that is gonna add to the prognosis. Okay. Now, if we have secondary MR, remember now in the guidelines, we have transcatheter edge to edge mitral valve repair, edge to edge mitral valve repair. They call it T-E-E-R. Or sometimes you will find it as P-E-E-R. Okay, whichever. Uh, tear or peer, T-E-E-R means transcutaneous edge to edge repair. Peer means percutaneous edge to edge repair. That's it, that's it. That means mitral clip, mitral clip. Now mitral clip is in the guidelines. So if you look here, if you have an ejection fraction lower than 
50 and you have MR and patient is still symptomatic despite optimal medical therapy, you may consider mitral clip, okay? For secondary MR, which is functional MR in a patient of persistent symptoms despite optimal GDMT, guideline directed medical therapy, okay? You consider peer or tear, mitral clip. Okay. Now, elevated PMP and pro-PMP is found in congestive heart failure. All the types of congestive heart failure, ref, pef, mildly reduced. In acute coronary syndrome, you can have it in hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, in restrictive cardiomyopathies, in constrictive pericarditis, in valve disease, in AF, in cardiac amyloid. You remember that the patient of pneumonia, we said that PMP is not necessarily cardiomyopathy. So, so many causes can lead to elevated pro-PMP. These are cardiac causes, and we also have non-cardiac causes. COPD, pulmonary embolism, pulmonary hypertension, sepsis, severe hypertension, subarachnoid hemorrhage, renal failure, liver cirrhosis, paraneoplastic syndromes. Okay? So, remember always to contextualize the PMP and pro-PMP. Back to the clinical picture. So if I give you a high PMP, you will never be able to interpret it unless you have information about the clinical data of the patient. This is, what is this here? Fluoro, That's right. right? So this fluoro is showing what? What did this lead? RV lead. RV lead, yes. Okay. And what is this? RA lead, right? And what is this? L or sinus. Okay, or cray sinus lead. And what are these? External wires. Good. You could also see it here. This one, this one, and this one. And of course, the ICD lead is marked with this coil here. So if you see this coil and you say this is a pacemaker, you are big wrong. This is ICD lead. So ICD is marked with a coil, coil. There is a coil, pacemaker lead, material coil there. Okay, you just, we will see the screw here, but not this coil, not this coil, okay? Good. So I think we stop here and tomorrow or after tomorrow, we are going to carry on because still we have a lot to discuss together. And sorry again for the hiccup and being late. And wish you all the best.